This is Chapter 30, Neuromuscular Dysfunction, Part 2, and we're on neurotube defects. On my exam, I'm only going to ask you about spina bifida, but we'll also quickly talk about anencephaly and encephalocele, since they're in the book and you might see them at the hospital. Anencephaly means no higher brain develops, right? An means none or non-existent, and then encephaly is brain. So this is a child with a brain stem, but nothing beyond that. This is not compatible with life. Uh, this child will, in the first few days to at the most um, a few weeks, uh, is all the lifespan that they will have. So our goal is going to be supporting um, and caring for this family and helping them to have the best experience they can with the short time that they have with their child. Encephalocele um, is a protrusion of meninges and spinal fluid between some bones of the cranium. It can be facial, it can be in the back, but somewhere. And how severe this is just depends on how much the cerebral tissue is um, affected by it. Here's a couple of pictures, one with on the facial area, one on the back. If it's just meninges and fluid, the child is going to need this surgically um, removed and, and the area uh, corrected, but um, they can do fairly well, but usually there's underlying issues with the brain um, tissue and then those do not go away. So spina bifida, this is our most common of the neurotube defects. Um, and it comes in two different forms. Spina bifida occulta is less severe. There isn't um, a, the, the nerves are not affected. And then spina bifida cystica, where you have an actual visible protrusion. That one has two different types. One where it's just the meninges and spinal fluid and the other where the spinal nerves um, are part of the defect. So here we go. Here's the occulta. This is the skin and this is, they call it a dimple. So the skin is pulled in and it's kind of an area of here. The meninges are caught between uh, two vertebrae. Down here we have a meninges seal. So the meninges, right, that covering around the spinal cord comes out between two vertebrae and it's filled with cerebral spinal fluid. This is our uh, myelomeningocele or meningomyelocele. You can put those two prefixes in either direction. It means you've got the meninges and the spinal nerves coming out here, pinched between two vertebrae. This can happen anywhere along the spine, but it's most common down in the sacral uh, lumbar area. Actually, this one's most commonly sacral and the other two most commonly lumbar. Well, here's just kind of another picture from the textbook, right? This is a cross section cut across. Here's the skin and a, a vertebrae. It doesn't close and you get the meninges bubbling out with or without spinal nerves in them. And this is similar to what I showed you before where you're kind of cut um, looking from the side. So prenatally, hopefully we find this on an ultrasound, um, but not always. And there is some surgical uh, interventions they're starting to do, prenatal surgery. Um, but the issue is you do have a higher risk of miscarriage with that. I don't know of anybody in our area doing it, but it's, it's something that's starting to be developed. Our big issue, in, or our big way of preventing this, is with folic acid. We have found that um, women who are taking supplements of folic acid while the neurotube is developing, which is just a couple weeks after conception, I mean, this is when a woman's just figuring out that she's pregnant, that's when the neurotube is developing. So the recommendation is that all women of childbearing age should be taking a folic acid supplement. There are enough unplanned pregnancies um, that by the time you figure out you're pregnant and start taking those prenatal vitamins with the extra folic acid, 
the neurotube is already developed. So there's also a higher risk if you've had one child with a neurotube defect, you have a high, you're at higher risk for having another. So our normal supplement is 0.4 milligrams per day, but if there's a history of neurotube defect, we're going to raise that to 4 milligrams per day for um, that woman. So there is a nursing alert in the book. And I love testing on these that we want all women of childbearing age taking folic acid to prevent this. Uh, and then if they've had a, a child with a nerve tube defect, they are at higher risk for another. So that spina bifida occulta, this does not have the bubble co coming out. Nothing visible, but that dimple, that in, that tucked in area of skin. Sometimes it's not the dimple, but it's a tuft of hair or a lipoma, which is a um, fatty uh, tumor or um, cyst. Something that is not noticed at birth but can is semi-related is a tethered cord. So this is an adhesion um, to one of the, the bones, the bony structures of the, the spinal column, so the vertebrae, uh, where there's some pulling, some tension on the spinal cord and it can affect gait, bowel, and bladder uh, habits, and cause some foot deformities. This is not going to be seen in infancy, though. It's going to be done or noticed later, and they do surgery to release that area that's being pulled. Here's a picture of the dimple, right? So that goes in. It's a tucked in area. So the big ones we're worried about, though, that have the long-term, the greatest long-term consequences are, are, are cystica, spina bifida cystica, particularly the myelomeningocele. And here we can see this baby born, I said most of the time they're lumbar. This has that sac of meninges filled with fluid. This one, the sac has been, um, has broken. So it can be anywhere, but usually lumbar or even lumbar, lumbosacral. Hopefully we diagnose this prenatally. If not, it's obvious at birth. The problem is you can imagine if it's not diagnosed till birth, we during labor have broken um, that meningeal uh, sac. That leads right into the spinal fluid that causes meningitis. Uh, meningitis is potentially fatal. So the it comes from that neurotube not closing properly in utero um, and that's again just weeks after conception. Now this is kind of a chicken and an egg. So does it not close because there's increased pressure that then pushes it open or is it somehow not closed and that causes the, the fluid to have abnormal pressures? doesn't really matter, but in 80 to 90 percent of these uh, babies, they have hydrocephalus. So they're going to um, need that treated, right? That's extra CSF um, inside the brain. So with that sac, our goal is to keep it intact to prevent it from tearing. We will take this child to surgery pretty quickly, 24 to 72 hours after birth. But while that sac is um, not been surgically repaired, we want to keep this child prone, no pressure on the sac, but we also want the parents interacting with them and touching them, and we want to treat this baby like a baby. They need to be talked to, touched, loved, uh, but they can't be held in any sort of way that puts pressure on that sac and potentially ruptures the sac. And they're not going to have a diaper because that's going to rub against it. Uh, preventing infection because that is meningitis and then promoting healing with the family. Um, so we already said it's usually lumbar. Depending on where it is and what nerves come out in it is what we're going to see as far as other effects. So if it's below that second lumbar uh, vertebrae, we're worried about paralysis of the lower extremities and most of the time we're going to see a neurogenic bladder and, and little or no bowel control. 
You can get deformities of the joints, particularly those hip joints in utero because they're not moving the legs normally. Um, it's not a guarantee you're going to have exactly the same thing from the right and left side. There may be a little more movement, a little more sensation on one side than the other. But this is a child who is going to have um, need a multidisciplinary approach and lifelong care, although they do amazingly well. So some of the things we want to do is prevent contractures. If you're not using a joint, it will contracture, so we need to avoid that. And then correct any existing deformities that happened from not using those joints in utero. Prevent or minimize uh, effects from motor and sensory deficits. And as you can see, this little girl's got uh, a walker and some sort of braces on her feet. Um, I've seen a lot of these kids are in wheelchairs, but I've seen kind of um, tricycle kind of things that are low to the ground so they can get themselves in and out even from a young age. They can use their hands then to roll the wheels. They learn very quickly how to just turn one wheel to turn one way and the other wheel to turn the other way. So they they may not have much use of their legs, but they, they learn how to get around. Um, skin breakdown, particularly the ones, the kids who are wheelchair bound, they probably do not have sensation either. So they can be sitting in the same position for hours doing damage and not feeling it. So we've got to really prevent skin breakdown. Um, our goal is to get the most function and the best function we can and to find whatever uh, adapt, adaptive equipment will help them. So GU, I said they probably are going to have a neurogenic bladder. By not emptying their bladder, not having a sense to, that they need to go, not being able to kind of bear down and go, they're going to be at prone for UTIs because there's always going to be old urine sitting in there. So we're going to do in and out catheters. Uh, over time, it's much more convenient to put in a metrophenol, which is what this child has. So they make an opening, usually right around the belly button, into the bladder, and they do in and out caths through the abdomen instead of through the urethra. Um, particularly for a girl, it's a whole lot easier. And for bowel control, again, they don't have the sensation and they don't have the ability to bear down. So diet will help, but may not be enough. We may need to put them on stool softeners, laxatives, things like that. Um, we really want to avoid constipation and impaction. Uh, but what a lot of these kids will end up with is an, some uh, device to do anti-grade enemas. When we give an enema, it's retrograde. We go from the rectum in. They're going to give it antegrade right at the beginning of the cecum. And then it will flow through that ascending, transverse, descending colon and push the stool out with them. So in a lot of ways, it's similar um, to the idea of the metrophenol, except it's ones for, for voiding and the others for stool. So again, it's on the abdomen and they'll give themselves an enema here and it will go through and push the stool out. This one's a chait. The other one they do at Children's Hospital is a Malone. The Malone uh, takes the appendix right there and brings that up to the surface. So there isn't this little plastic thing where the chait there is, but either one is to do an antegrade enema. And the child will kind of figure out their own bowel habits of when they do it, how much fluid they need, and um, get on a nice routine bowel program. These kids, they're doing in and out casts, they're doing these enemas, they also usually have quite a few surgeries. They are exposed to so much latex, they are very, very likely to develop a latex allergy. So what we do is we just put them on latex precautions before they develop the allergy because a latex allergy can be life-threatening. It can be an anaphylactic reaction. Uh, it often starts off milder, but as we keep exposing them, the uh, reaction can become more severe. And so uh, we're going to try and minimize how much latex they're exposed to by putting them on that latex precautions early.